Let's bring in Ryan Leaf, the aforementioned college football NFL analyst for Westwood One, NFL Network, and the number two overall pick by the Chargers, 1998 draft. The David Tepper fine for throwing a drink on some Jacksonville Jaguar fans. $300,000. Ryan Leaf says what? Great. I mean, it's a, what is that, like a tip jar for him? Is that enough? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this the behavior that you can control from a, a billionaire owner who's seemingly shown everybody that, you know, he has uh, real control issues, I think. And that was showcased, I don't know, $300,000 for a guy who's a billionaire in terms of what that is means anything to him. I mean, he might find that in his cushions of his couch. So, Well, I said suspend him. Like, don't let him go to a game. Yeah. Because that's the value. Uh, there, you know, Steve Ballmer is one of the richest men on the planet. He gets to go to Clipper games. You know, take away that that uh, item, that team, then I think that's more painful. Give him an embarrassing timeout, an NFL timeout, send him to his room and say, you can't go for the last game of this uh, regular season. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the job of the commissioner if the commissioner wasn't intimately intimately involved with oh, yeah. the 32 owners or 31 owners. You know, it's it's he works for them. So it, it's got to be incredibly odd for the – your employee essentially to turn around and go. I'm going to fine you thirty three hundred thousand dollars for for your uh, indiscretions. It's just an odd odd relationship in in general. It's a privately run company, and it's weird to that. I wonder how that money turns around and comes back to to him some way somehow. <laughs> it's true. You know? It's true. Uh, Bryce Young, how would you assess what like if you're looking at handicapping him as an analyst and a former quarterback? What would you say to Carolina fans? I'd say uh, usually you have to see how a, a player is going to react, right? When you go through adversity like that, when people are tossing the bust word at you and saying you're a failure and all those things, how are you emotionally um, mature enough to deal with it? And I think Bryce Young's an incredibly mature, emotional young man. I really do. So I don't have any fear in him being able to weather it and doing well and getting better in year two, regardless of who is at the helm. My only fear is the team is awful. I mean, there's no skill position players. They have not added to it. They would have the number one overall pick if they didn't trade it away to the Chicago Bears. So that's my bigger issue this. When you when you get drafted first or second or third overall, you're going to a bad team, period. And you have to have, I would say, generational um, ability to, to change the culture and the environment of a football team. It's just, it's rare. You got Joe Burrow in, in Cincinnati. You got Peyton Manning in Indianapolis. It's just a an individual that can walk into a building, and he can change the environment that he's in. And that is incredibly difficult when you don't have the skill position players. And that's where they're lacking right now. They don't have the draft picks. They don't have the money. I don't know if any coach worth his merit really wants to go there because of the ownership. Somebody's going to take it because they're going to get paid, you know, generational wealth. And so it's it's a tough spot. It was tough sledding. I think C.J. Stroud probably is thanking his lucky stars that. He wasn't the first overall pick a year ago. If I said to David Tepper, you could redo number one overall pick. Well, I think that uh, from what I heard from it, it was uh, uh, it was his influence on on Bryce Young. But let's say I said this to him privately. Publicly, he can't say, "Well, no. I take C.J. Stroud." But well, but if I said you could redo this, I, I have a question about that. Okay. I have a question around whether C.J. Stroud in that Carolina Panthers uniform is any better than what Bryce Young has been this year. That's fair. It's the team aspect of things. I understand the quarterback gets so much of the recognition, both good and both bad, when things go right or wrong. But it is a team game. It is the ultimate team game. If all 11 aren't functioning on the same level every single week, it's not going to be successful. And everything gets laid at the feet of the quarterback. I really have a problem with the idea that if you put C.J. Stroud in Carolina, they would be a, you know, they'd be vying for the playoffs in the NFC South right now. Yeah, but we're making the Texans roster sound like it's a lot better than what it is. The offensive line was incredibly good to start the season. Yeah, but the skilled position, if I said they got Dalton Schultz, nobody's going, yes. I mean, and even some of these other receivers that kind of came out of nowhere, I don't know if, we, you know, it, it wasn't like it's a Tyreek Hill nope, and you know, right. the Chiefs. You know, Tank was wonderful. He got in. Nobody knew him. Anybody who was down in Houston knew him, but... uh because he went to the university there. I I think that C.J. Stroud makes players better. I think his Who skill, is a better quarterback? I had C.J. Stroud, as you know, going into the draft as my number one guy. That was that was far and away. I thought there was 
uh, a sizable difference between the two. I thought the size was the big difference for Bryce Young in terms of, you know, what he looked like in, in comparison to Kyler Murray because Kyler was such a stout guy down downstairs, um, his baseball background, yeah. you know, and, and just the size was going to give Bryce Young a problem unless you had an offense that really was structured around him and then you go and fire the guy that you brought in to do that and his quarterback coach, you know, midway through the year. So, I mean, it's been exactly – how first round draft, first overall picks sometimes when they go to bad teams end up. New coach, all the things, new offensive coordinator, all the things that go with that. And unfortunately, uh, it's going to be tied to CJ Stroud's success. If they were to win this weekend and go to the playoffs, boy, that's even a bigger uh, insult to injury on, on that draft pick. How is Joe Flacco doing this? I am so impressed with Joe Flacco. I Now, hey, I'll say this. And I've been coming on your show for years and Polly and and McLovin, back in the day, you know, we'd go out and do do crazy stunts, right? We're in New York, we're throwing the ball up into the, through the window. At, you know, <laughs> we can still throw it. That's never going to go away. We always will be able to throw the what football. What goes away? Uh, I think the you, the burst, right? When you want to get out of the pocket, the burst, uh, flexibility, mobility, all those things. Um, but what I also think goes away is your ability to to read things as quickly and decipher as quickly. But Joe never had a burst. No, and he never needs one. And he doesn't now because he deciphers and disseminates what goes on on the defensive side of the football. And I think Kevin Stefanski and him really have a connection in terms of how they see offensive play, you know? And they're not afraid to let him just toss it around. Like, you know, what was it, a few weeks ago where he threw the three interceptions plus the three touchdowns? It's it's not a sink or swim when it comes to that. They know they're going to have good, positive things. And the dismantling of the Jets the other night, I mean, wow, that was... The most points ever, or second most points ever, scored by the Browns in a first half, 34 points. That's crazy to think, and Joe Flacco's doing it. They they are in a really good position because they may have they may have a walkthrough uh, in the AFC uh, wild card round, and then they're right in the divisional, most likely against, Bal- uh, against Baltimore, essentially, unless somebody behind him l- wins. Um, and they've won there this year. So, I mean, you put Joe Flacco and what they're doing offensively in a position with that defense, I mean, Cleveland's a real problem in the AFC for some people, I believe. We're talking to Ryan Leaf, the uh, former college quarterback uh, with uh, Washington State. Go Cougs! Yeah, and uh, in the NFL with the Chargers. Uh, we're now working for Westwood One and NFL Network. You know, sometimes when you're looking at a team, you're trying to figure out just how good they are And and at this point of the season. I don't know if I know how good Kansas City is. I don't know if I know how good Miami is. And I don't know if I know how good Dallas is. And those are three teams that could go to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, I would argue that I think you know more about Kansas City. You may not know who they are this year, but the pedigree, the evidence, there hasn't been no evidence that Miami or Dallas will do anything. But how do you overcome bad receivers? Uh, Well, I mean, we had good receivers and they had to overcome a bad quarterback a lot of the time. (laughs) But I would would say that I think the the game plan will do that. I think Travis Kelsey's got to step up. I mean, he's been missing in action for the last few weeks. I think it's, what, six or seven consecutive weeks without a touchdown Yeah, catch. but how does that happen? Um, I, playoff football is a different deal, and they know it better than anybody. It's where they live. But I'm saying, Travis Kelsey, how do you get – how are you MIA? Uh, how are you MIA? Well, I think people take uh, defensive measures to, to take him away. I also think that there's been a diminishment in his athletic ability just because of the age and the beating he's taken over his career. I do think that – is real. I think, you know, uh, time. It does feel like it's starting to show a little bit. It is. But I don't know if it's ever, is it that abrupt where it's like, oh my God. I think so. I mean, if it feels that way when I watch and sometimes I'll see Watson making an athletic play, not Travis Kelsey. And I, but I think it's Kelsey just out of habit. It, it's, uh, I've called two of their games in the last uh, five weeks. And so I've seen, you know, they. he's been open a lot. There is a a mistrust right now with Patrick Mahomes in terms of what is being called, what he's seen, and what he's willing to go through through a progression. I mean, in that Raiders game, he had a ton of guys that were open. He just doesn't have the same confidence to let it go like he has in the years past. And not much has changed in terms of the wide receiver position from last year to this year. Juju Smith-Schuster was really the only difference yeah. in all of this. And so that's the big thing for me. I don't I don't worry too much about Kansas City in the playoffs. I think they host; uh, they're going to host the first round most likely against. Well, I think I think the Bills go into Miami and win, so that means that Miami is going to go to Kansas City in Week One of the AFC uh, Wild Card Weekend. And I I don't think Miami is able to go to the cold and get the win there. All of that 
So I think you go to a divisional round, you think most likely go to the Bills, and uh, and you just don't know. I have more faith in Kansas City, Andy Reid, Patrick Holmes, all that because of their past. And until somebody actually steps up and does it, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, not ride with them when it comes to the playoff time. All right, you have to throw it to one of these guys. Yeah, game on the line. Game on the line. Kadarius Tony or uh, Valdez Scantling. Uh, Kadarius Tony, because I'll probably throw it to him behind the line of scrimmage, and his athletic ability could do it. MSV for me has just been uh, just missing in action down the field, um, wherever he's at. He hasn't how do you been. forget how to catch a football? I I don't think you forget how to catch a football. I think if you look at the amount of drops that have that have happened, um, it, it isn't it isn't a dramatic amount. Justin Watson's the one that leads the team and leads the league, I think, in in drop passes. So that's the guy you got to be looking at more. He's unfortunately uh, MSV has been um, on the field and taking more snaps than anybody else, and just isn't being targeted enough because of the things that people are speculating and what Patrick Mahomes has to see. You can go back and look at some of the games from the Kansas City Chiefs this year, and at a point you could have had them at twelve and one through thirteen games with the outcomes of of those games. The Kadarius Tony drop for an interception in game one. You got the MSV uh, non interference call. Uh, in Green Bay, the drop pass in Philly, with Philly, uh, the Kadarius Tony lining up off sides, uh, and the Bills, all those games yeah. are down the stretch. So you flip a coin there. Where they were thoroughly beaten was the game I call on Christmas Day was against the Raiders. I mean, they, were, they didn't belong in that game at all. Max Crosby owned the Kansas City Chiefs in that game. So I loved how they came back last week when they were down, had an understanding of what they had to do. They shut out uh, the Bengals in the second half, and I think that was meaningful, and they got their eighth consecutive division Win. I love watching Max Crosby. Me too. I got to see him before the game. We haven't gotten to see each other in person in a while. As you know, him and I have a lot of things in common, and I love him to death, and that's the first thing he did. He just came and picked me up and told me he loved me. And Did he contact you when he was going through substance abuse? He didn't contact me personally. We have a, a mutual friend because they care about us who works inside and with the NFL players, and, and since that time, it, you know, it's – We've just been there for one another. That's what we do. Could you imagine have played in Vegas when you started out? Not, not with the way. If I was who I am now, playing in Vegas, it would be amazing because I would be centrally focused on what I needed to. All that and other nonsense wouldn't exist, and I would get all the great things that come with it. What I love about Darren Waller and what I love about Max Crosby and so many others that are gone through some of the uh, things they've gone to and, and come out the other side and are in recovery and doing that in the NFL – is that they're still doing it in the prime of their careers where they can be great. If I would have been able to find that, if I would have been accepting to what that could be at the time, imagine me being able to play in my prime with this type of mindset. That's just, that's a, that's a regret that's always going to be there. Now, I'm incredibly grateful and, and, and amazed at what this life has given me now at 47 years old, but those two in particular um, have just been... Uh, sources of, of, of great inspiration for me. And they're, you know, a decade and a half younger than me. So that's, that's amazing. Would you still be alive if you started out in Vegas? Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't a hard drugs guy, though. You know, I was an opiate guy, and I didn't use when I played. So I, I didn't use when I played. I, I thought competition was my drug of choice. I would go out and binge drink with the boys, and that's how I felt better about everything. But, but I never... Touched a drug until after I was done. I'd love to blame that I was a poor quarterback because I was <laughs> drugged out all the time, but um, I can't do that. I'd just go with that. I might. I might. It's a good excuse. Well, if I wasn't an absolute train wreck. Uh, but what did it give you? The opioid? Yeah. that It, it numbed me. I was so sick and tired of feeling But like, you couldn't have played football? No. I, I, I know people that have used and they'll go out and play basketball or I, I couldn't. And I also didn't want to waste it on anybody. <laughs> you know, I, I like a pretty girl would want to go on a date or something like that. Nah, you know, I was like Gollum from, you know, the Lord of the Rings. And it was my precious, you know, and I was just, I was that guy in the dark, blinds closed. It was mine and I didn't want to feel anything. That's what it did for me. And I think it's done that for a lot of people. But yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it's uh, it's a it's a terrible disease and, and one that uh, that uh, had a hold of me for a while. Well, look at you now. Look at me now. Look I'm in the man cave. <laughs> yeah. Am I the only? Am I the only guy that comes into the studio anymore? Uh, Chris Sims has been in here. Ross Tucker's been in here. Well, Ross, yeah, I mean, because he hosts your show too. Yeah. Uh, Sandler was in here. Oh, yeah. Sandler came in, shot hoops. Do you know? Do you remember the story? Uh, was the Indianapolis 
the Super Bowl, and he was uh, previewing a movie, and he grabbed us, that's, and we went. That's my boy. That's my boy. And, and that was uh, Sierra was in that movie. And uh, um, we walked into the theater in the back at the end, and he sat next to me, and I was what? I was probably a month away from being arrested for the final time, and I was just still kind of just teetering on. But he like sat there next to me, and he just kept looking at my um, um, reactions to it, what I laughed at and everything like that. And he talked to me, and it was just so kind and everything. I just That's something I remember. And I don't remember a lot of the stuff when I was going through all that. But all now things. he's finding out you were stoned at the time. So I wasn't stoned at the time. I was <laughs> counting the seconds that we could get out of there, that I could get back to the hotel and take my pills that night. I know I was, wow. I was doing that. So instead of just absolutely, look where you're at. You're sitting next to Adam Sandler watching one of his movies. Dan Patrick and the Dan Anson, everybody like that, who, who, who've cared for you forever. And you're just, all you're thinking about is this. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll come back. We'll talk some uh, college football. Also, uh, coaches you think are safe, coaches you think are going to get fired in the NFL. We'll take a break. We'll continue with Ryan Leaf right after this. Ryan Leaf, stand with us. College football NFL analyst for Westwood One NFL Network. Has his own TV show, The Straight Line, with Ryan Leaf. Also uh, travels the country, speaking about uh, substance abuse, mental health. His story, in his own words, available where you get your podcast, Bust, the Ryan Leaf story. When do you get to the point where you embrace that word bust, or you don't try to fend it off as much as you used to? Um, I can use it. No one else can. So it pisses me off, and I can be resentful, and I can, I can point it out, because none of you have any idea. But I can use it. And that's what I did. I used it for my benefit. Um, uh, that's the way I look at it. I, Were you a bust? Um, I don't think any player who has ever been drafted and played in the NFL is a bust. I think the team made the decision because we had no say in where we went. Now, if I would have had the decision and said, okay, I'm going to go to San Diego as the second overall pick, um, then it's all on me. But I didn't make that decision. Their choice was to say that he's the second best quarterback in the, the draft. And we're going to go with him. Was I more of a, let's say, a third-round guy? I had the talent, probably, of a first-round guy, but maybe not the mentality of a first-round guy. And uh, so there's a lot of that goes into it. I think that the ability to evaluate quarterback play uh, shifted and changed a lot with our draft, just the way my mind worked, um, how they evaluated it, who they talked to. Um, and But they still, you know, you still make mistakes. Um, you just never know on the things that you and I talked about before how to quantify what life-changing money is going to do, and what failure at the highest possible level is going to do. But now that NIL has been introduced, you are going to get to start to see how life-changing money may change the mindset behavior of these young quarterbacks coming into the league. So I think that will do, a, do and will go a long way to help the evaluation process. But do you think getting money sooner is going to help these players before they get to, you know, when they get to the NFL, that they've already gotten a million dollars? Yeah, I do. I think that you're going to find out. I think people are going to find out pretty quick. They're like, you know, they're not going to be the first overall pick if all of a sudden they were given a million, two million dollars while they're in college. And, you know, the Ryan Leaf show happens. You know, that's, you're not going to be taken with the first overall pick at that point. I don't care how talented you are. Um, they're just not willing to take on that liability and that risk anymore when you have such talented players available right behind them. What do you think Jim Harbaugh will do? What do you think he should do? I think, you and I talked about this last time on the show about what the next step for him is. I think if he wins a national championship, I think he walks out and takes an NFL job and looks for the, the next thing, the, the Super Bowl championship that he's missing. Um, if they get beat by Washington, which is a real good, good chance that happens, um, I don't know. I mean, it's just seemingly over the last three years, they've been the best team in the Big Ten and, and fallen short every single time. They got over the hump with Alabama. Is that the next thing, I don't know. I love Jim Harbaugh. You know, as you know, we go way back. Uh, I want success for him. Um, but I just, can he have that style that he has in college? Can he replicate that in the NFL? Yeah, he has. He's proven it. He, but he is, is the NFL going to be the same as it was when he left the yeah, Niners? I think he'll. I think he'll be just fine. He is a player's coach. He because he was just one of the guys. He was a guy that could play almost into his 40s because he knew what the locker room was felt like. And you've seen how he's dealt with the players there talking about how they should be uh, included in revenue sharing, all the things that have really pissed the NCAA off. And I do think has become a, a real target because of some of the things that he said. He's got the players' backs. They love him to death. I mean, they're willing to wear free Harbaugh shirts running around 
after he's been suspended for six of the 13 games he's been in this year. It's crazy, or 14 games. So it's, I, I think he'll do just fine. If, if they were to win a championship, I do think he, he, he walks and heads to the NFL. What do you do if you're the Bears? I, you keep Justin Fields. I've, I've been adamant about that ever since the, after the Denver Broncos game and the Wa- Washington Commanders game where he played it lights out. Then he got hurt. Came back, and he's played incredibly well. They're going to have a ton of draft stock. They're going to be able to move that number one pick. They probably can go get find a way to get Marvin Harrison Jr. or who I think the best wide receiver in the draft is, Roman Dunze, and, and make a real difference for this young quarterback. It's don't, don't stop uh, before the miracle happens. And that's, that's the thing in the NFL a lot of times. You just walk off and you leave assets at the door when... Is he a good enough passer? I do think he's a good enough passer, yes. I think he's improved. I think he'll continue to improve. I think this offseason, the fact that they're keeping their head coach and Getsy's going to be the guy, offensive coordinator-wise, that's going to be the first for him to have back-to-back So if you're Matt Eberflus, you're betting your job. Ryan Poles, the GM. You're betting your job on if you keep Justin Fields and it doesn't go well and you passed on Caleb Williams or Drake May or Jaden Daniels. You're willing to do that? Yes, and I don't know if they are. <laughs> I am. I'm willing to, to ride with Justin Fields. You're exactly right when it comes to Ryan Poles. If he moves off, which I thought he might, I thought he might move off of Matt Eberflus, and he might move off of Justin Fields, which I think extends him maybe five more years to do a rebuild. Yes. So doing this, saying Matt Eberflus is coming back, and the more and more I hear that they're going to utilize that number one pick to get a ton of draft capital and keep the quarterback that they think could be a difference maker – um, I, I think he does put his job at jeopardy. And, and I think that's good. I think there is some investment. I think there's some desperation in, in what that looks like, and they're all tied to it and in together. If they all believe that with one another, if Ryan Poles has sat down with Justin Fields, with Matty DeFluis, and said, hey, I got your back. Because that's what we're looking for so much as players from ownership, from the front office. We want somebody to have your back. And if they don't believe in you, they're not going to have that. And it's just going to be this up and down thing that, that you play, and you cannot be successful. You cannot be a champion. Uh, at that level, if you don't have that kind of uh, that backing, how would you feel if you're Russell Wilson? Awful, awful. I, you guys have heard me talk about Russell, and just because of the relationship with, with his mentor and one of my great mentors after I got out of prison, Trevor Moad, um, and how that affected him, and uh, and just to kind of, it, the narratives are always hilarious to me. Uh, and the caricature of a person who's made out to be who they're made out to be in the media and all this thing, no one ever really knows at all. But the fact that a guy that's making $250, $230 million uh, is a sympathetic figure in what has played out is, is, a, is a, a bit hilarious to me because, um, yeah, it sucks. You know, They wanted him to take a cut of his paycheck and do something differently, uh, or they were going to you know sit him down, and Sean Payton and him don't seem to see eye to eye, and people – thinking Matt, you know, Stidham's going to be just the same. I, I, I think that Russell Wilson's still an elite quarterback. Uh, I think he can play. It's just a matter of where the system is and where he goes, and who knows where he goes next. But Okay, but let's say he said to management, all right, I'll restructure this. Why not do that? I think that would have been calling their bluff. And yes, that's what I would have done. Yeah. I'd be like, all right, I'm going to restructure. We, we, we go. Whatever you need. Whatever you need. I want to be a champion yes. here with you. Let's do it. Um, and I think they all looked at each other in the, in the meeting and went, nah, we're good. We- but how does Sean Payton take this job knowing that he's got that contract there with a quarterback that he may not like? I mean, I don't know what the hell Sean Payton's doing. I mean, he, he wanted the Chargers job, and it didn't come open. Yeah. Because then you got your Justin Herbert, you're ready to go. Yeah. And you're in L.A., everything's – then all of a sudden you go, okay, you got Russ, don't have you know a first-round draft pick. And you now, now you don't have a second because they traded it away for you, Sean Payton, too. Yeah, that's right. You know, so <laughs> I just don't know why he took that job. I don't know why he took the job other than to get paid a bunch of money. Yeah, but he was going to get paid. He was going to get $15 million or whatever it's going to be. He'd get that. But I, I just don't know why you'd go into a situation where you knew that that quarterback is locked up for a long time. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Sean Payton's. I used to be. I don't know why that shifted. I just think some of the things that he's done this year, and I actually stuck up for him a few times because I thought it was benefiting Russ. But but yeah. he's yelling in your face. That doesn't normally happen with a head coach and your star quarterback. Can you imagine in my heyday if he would have done that? No, you me? wouldn't have done well. 
Oh, no. Well, I would have done fine. He would have been buried <laughs> under Mile High Stadium is what would have happened there. I give Russ Wilson a ton of credit. You would have gone spree well on yeah, him. Yeah, that dude would have been P.J. Carlissimo was asked <laughs> out, right? And it, I couldn't believe that. On Thanksgiving, in the only game, it's the only game everybody's watching. I know. You know, it's the only one on TV. And he's berating this man here uh, after just... I don't, what we heard maybe have been that Russ didn't take enough time for him to anal, uh, analyze to see whether he should have challenged a couple of those plays. Whatever. Your job as a coach, don't take it out on the quarterback at that point. You know, do that in private. I loved Russ's response as he just took it, um, you know, in respect. But, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a rough year. And you always, you always find out the most about people when they have to go through the, the most arduous and, and adverse conditions of, of anything. Ryan Leaf here in studio, uh, Westwood One analyst, also NFL Network. Um, you're still high on Michael Penix Jr.? I mean, am I the first one, really? I mean, I think, I mean, I, had you heard much about him when I, when I came on the show and said I would have taken him one overall? I think I in last not, year's draft, he would have been uh, one of the top two quarterbacks taken. Um, would you, do you think Penix would have been over Bryce Young? I think he. I, I don't know if he would have. If I was doing the the work then, okay. Yeah, I've been high on him for two years now. He's been the best quarterback in all of college football for two consecutive. But why? Seasons. Why is nobody else on this bandwagon? He's probably the fourth injuries, or fifth. The injuries from at Indiana. Team. Yeah, and I'm like, well, he's gone and played what almost thirty games in the last two years, injury free, and and what he feels like. Bo Nix had more momentum, and I just don't than Michael him. Penix Jr. Yeah. I, I've been on the, uh, I, I, you know, I about, I about got, uh, I think, murdered by LSU people before the Heisman um, because I was so adamant about how Michael Penix Jr. was the, the Heisman Trophy winner this year. Okay. And uh, um, he's just been the best leader. And where I think it translates to the NFL level the best is because of what Kalen Babor and, uh, and Ryan Grubb do offensively. It is very pro style. It is... Um, if, if you line it up to what you see the best offenses in pro football right now, they're very similar in terms of leverage, numbers, and he's had the wide receivers that he's going to deal with at the next level too, guys that are elite, um, those wide receivers. But I've never seen a player, I don't know how long, maybe since Joe Burrow with those receivers being as accurate down the field as Michael Penix Jr. has been this year. Those passes that go 40, 50 yards down the field, it's like he couldn't have placed it if he ran up to the guy and put it in his hands better than what it looked like against Texas. And what strikes me as so ironic is this is the first time a lot of people in the entire country watched him play. <laughs> and they're just like, what? He's been that guy for the last two years. He has been that guy. He'll continue to be that guy. And whoever gets him at the next level is going to have a heck of a franchise quarterback. I do believe that. Well, we're lazy. We watch highlights. <laughs> I always tell people, watch an entire game with a quarterback. Because then you're going to get a truer sense of, Highs and lows, interception, what do you do after that? You got sacked, what do you do after that? You, you make something happen. Whatever it is, that's when you get a true sense of a quarterback and leadership and intangibles, all of those things. When you watch the highlights, it's easy to go, it's, God, that guy's amazing. unbelievable. That's what, that's what I think in the broadcasting world and being an analyst is uh, set me up for success. I've watched every single snap of every NFL game this year. Every one. And I know there are other guys that are like that. That sounds like punishment. I think it's not. It's so much fun. Come on. It's absolutely the funnest thing in the world. And what the NFL uh, <laughs> Plus has been able to do with the condensed game, 40 minutes of just the play, and then none of the nonsense of the guys talking on the, on the TV about it, I, I think that's been the, a game changer for me in terms of how I have become an analyst and I think will be sustainable for me to be able to do it for a long time because of that. And my little baby girl, who's four weeks old, just sleeps on my chest. You Do you go. remember the sports? You remember Three Men and a Little Baby? Yeah. And Tom Selleck is reading the Sports Illustrated to the baby, but doing it in the voice uh, of like how you talk to babies. And they're like, "What are you reading to her?" It's like he's talking about the big uh, heavyweight fight that a guy knocks his tooth out or bloodies him up. She's like, "You can't read that to her. She doesn't understand." I'm just doing it in the right voice. So I'm laying Claiborne on my chest there, and I, Anna's watching it, and I'm watching the Washington. Uh, Texas game, and I'm doing the, the color commentary, but I'm doing it in the voice. <laughs> and I just see this little girl just looking up at me like, and I just thought about that. And I, I said, I'm pretty lucky. I'm a pretty lucky guy. Uh, but she likes to show up to hear Herb Street, though. That's the weird thing about that. You know, it's your well, daughter. But, it, but It puts her to sleep. Yeah, she so, loves, wow. Works. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That works. Better college quarterback, you or Herb Street? Um, I'd go Herb Street, probably. Really? Ohio State, right? Isn't that better? Than Washington State, 
That's what everybody tells us. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Wait. <laughs> oh, a little pity party. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes the Cougars. <laughs> hey, pack two. Uh, two. Hey, pack two. I think we're going to, you know, I, I'm putting this out there right now. <laughs> Apple, buy us. I'll be, your, I'll be your color commentary. All right, let's do it. You can be the commissioner. I think you I, can't do worse. I could do worse. <laughs> I don't know. I was the commissioner of a fantasy football league in a prison cell. Uh, so that's <laughs> wait. So, you that's ran. Worse. You ran fantasy in prison. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think my name was just on it. Oh, it got me extra ramen every week. I think is what it was. Okay. Yeah. All right. It was all about hustling in there. You know, I'm all I, about hustling. Yeah. Yep. Take your word for it. Yep. College football NFL analyst Westwood One and uh, our favorite, uh, Ryan Leaf, NFL Network, and he'll be on the call. You have the Division One AA or FBS, whatever the FCS, damn thing. FCS, yeah. FCS. So it's Montana? Yep. South Dakota State? Yep. It's the Jackrabbits and the Grizzlies. I love it. Yeah. All right, so that's Sunday. That is Sunday up against the NFL games. Of course. Uh, we'll, we'll win that battle easy. Um, Why not Saturday? I don't know. I haven't questioned it, but maybe when I get to Frisco here in the next day or Frisco, two. Frisco, Texas. Frisco, Texas. I will ask that question. I'm like, yeah. why not on Saturday? Yeah, nice Saturday, early afternoon. Yeah, early afternoon before the late kickoff of the NFL. Yeah. 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 Maybe we can change it. Maybe you and I. I will, I'll do my best. You know, I'll do um, my best. And then we can confuse grizzly people. Maybe they'll miss it completely uh, you know, uh, and, not, and not get a chance to hear me call it. Grizzly people are not very happy that I'm calling this game. You're from Montana. But I'm a Cats fan. Oh, Montana, Montana State. State. Oh. So they're not happy about it. Supposed to be unbiased. I will be unbiased, but they don't think I will. Did they recruit you? They did. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that you turned them down. Well, they had a great they had the greatest quarterback in college football history that came out of Montana, Dave Dickinson. They didn't need me. <laughs> Seriously, guy's a college football hall of famer. Walter <laughs> okay. Payton Award winner. Went up and won a great cup in the <laughs> CFL. Dude is a, and he grew up a block away from me and was my hero growing up. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a uh, I'm a big fan of Montana quarterbacks, but uh, I'm, the fact that I get to call a national championship, that'd be good. It's a resume builder. It is. How many people get to call national championships, Dan? I'm going to uh, tune in and just try to read into your bias there. There won't be any. Yeah, there probably be, be any. a little bit there. Nope. All right, uh, we'll take a break. Last call for phone calls. What we learn. What's in store tomorrow? 